So um, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Elise. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to kind of talk to you guys a little bit about my background before we jump into my presentation. Um, I started cooking at a very young age, just naturally inclined um, in the culinary arts. Uh, my junior and senior year of high school, I was very fortunate to uh, be accepted into a culinary technical program uh, that was took up half of my day. Um, Initially, I was interested in it because I was a very, um, wasn't a great student. I didn't do great in a classroom setting, um, sitting at a desk, listening to somebody talk to me. I was much more of a hands-on learner. Um, and at the time, I didn't quite know that that was even an option, but I was interested in pursuing the culinary arts um, and interested in not spending as much time at my homeschool. So my first year um, of doing that, something really clicked. I was incredibly engaged, interested in, in the curriculum and the things that we were learning. And so I did it again my senior year. Um, and through that program, I was able to connect with other chefs. We would have guest chefs come to, come to the school, host dinners that were open to the public, and the students would help um, execute those dinners. Um, and so about a month after I graduated high school, I moved to um, the Berkshires in Massachusetts to work for one of those chefs. And I ended up staying there for four years. Um, I had originally planned on going to culinary school um, that following uh, fall um, after graduating and um, after some time of working with people in the industry uh, side by side, um, realized that it wasn't necessarily a requirement in order to um, uh, pursue that as a career. So I forewent culinary school and ended up um, spending four years in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, working various jobs as a baker, um, as a line cook, etc. cetera. Um, I moved back to Kansas City briefly with the intention of uh, changing up my career path. I had kind of reached a a period of burnout. I was just working so much. Um, and I thought I would try my hand at farming. Um, I had a relative in South America and spent a few months down there woofing um, and came back to Kansas City after that and immediately found myself in the kitchen again. Um, and there's been many examples of that kind of love-hate relationship throughout my career of um, thinking that I want to get out of the industry and then finding myself back in it after a period of a you know, some time off from that. Um, when I moved back to Kansas City, I met my um, now husband. Um, he was really one of the first people that kind of took, um, you know, being a chef as like, he took me seriously as far as like that being my, uh, my career path and um, was extremely supportive and was the one that really like talked me into like us opening a restaurant together. Um, we decided to leave Kansas City. We were really interested in living in the Northwest because of the natural beauty, um, proximity to you know beautiful ingredients and seafood, um, and eventually landed in um, Olympia. Um, and about a year after moving there, we um, found a space that was available downtown um, and started to pursue um, opening a restaurant there. Um, I. Uh, started making moves to open the restaurant. We got uh, our lease signed, we got keys to the space, we got our loan approved, we got a loan through SBA. Um, and all of this kind of got wrapped up right at like the beginning or like the middle of February of 2020. And so like two weeks later, everything shut down. Um, so the timing was kind of insane. Um, we have since stuck through it. We've gone through many, um, uh, different iterations of what chicory is now um, from when we started um, because we had to just be very flexible but um, I'm really proud to say that we're still here and I think that through the last almost four years of us being a restaurant there are a lot of things that um, hopefully are uh, beneficial to you guys listening um, in regards to you know managing a staff um, sourcing locally 
um, and just like trying to run a business um, from a ethical standpoint and in, in the way of, you know, uh, it aligning with your, uh, your values as a business. Um, so I'm going to get started on my presentation um, and share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> hey, Paige. Are you there? I'm here. Hey. Okay. Hopefully you can cut this out. Um, my cat's got the fucking zoomies right now. I got to let her out of the room. Oh yeah. No problem. <laughs> She's like running circles around my bedroom. Okay. Extremely uh, distracting. Okay. So anyway, we'll cut that bit out hopefully. Um, all right. So let me share my screen with you guys and share my presentation. All right. So um, we'll be kind of covering, Paige has already said, but three different elements of sustainability, um, social, economical, and environmental. Um, we'll start with social. That's kind of the biggest chunk and um, sometimes the most uncomfortable part because you're working with other people, but um, I'm going to talk you guys through it. Um, so at Chicory, we kind of have a unique structure to our employment Um you know, one of the benefits of working in the restaurant industry is you don't really need a lot of um, background uh, education or experience necessarily. It's really like if you're ready to work um, and you've got the right attitude, you're willing to work really hard, you can go very far with that. Um, so it is very accessible and can be accessible to people who may even have like prior uh, criminal history or things like that. Um, so it's a very like equal playing field in that regard. Um, another thing that works for us is that a lot of our employees are working um, under 40 hours a week. A lot of them have other um, interests, hobbies, jobs, um, what have you that and the and working in the restaurant is kind of just supplemental income for them. And they're able to, you know, have a more alternative um, lifestyle in the sense that maybe they're an artist or a photographer or um, a musician or something like that, and um, are able to pursue that as their primary uh, career, but have something to fall back on and work, uh, you know, a few hours or a few days a week to be able to supplement their income. Um, and that, in that regard, a lot of our staff are not full time. Um, a lot of times they are um, working three to four days a week um, and working less than 30 or 40 hours. So like 20 to 30 hours a week. Um, this also kind of adds to a like more fun working environment um, because we have different people coming in and working together. Um, it makes for like less of a chance of there to be interpersonal conflict because it's always like new, new people working together. Um, also, we've got folks that have other interests and hobbies outside of the restaurant and kind of bring that uh, to work. Um, in the sense that there's just more versus uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, diversity as far as interests in and um, types of people that come into the restaurant so it really adds to like a positive work environment um, with our employees working uh, fewer hours we have less of a potential of them getting um, overtime which is uh, valuable to us from a payroll perspective um, and it also avoids the staff from getting burnout because they're working too many hours a week and they're able to kind of uh, take some time away from the restaurant. Um, when it comes to interviewing, um, generally the way this works is someone will come drop off a resume, if whether we're hiring uh, and we advertise that or sometimes people just show up. Some of our best employees that we've had have just walked in without any prior uh, advertisement and just drop off a resume and they have to happen to be there at the right place at the right time. Um, we usually have an interview um, that we'll schedule. Um, the kind of questions that I like to ask are some, you know, some obvious uh, questions about, um, you know, if you have like what your availability is, if you have reliable transportation, things like that. But then I also like to ask some more personal questions like, um, proudest accomplishments. And these don't all have to be culinary related. I, I like to just get to know the, the full person um, and who, who uh, I'm interviewing. Um, I like to ask them what kind of meals they've cooked for a loved one or a memorable, memorable dining experience that they might've had. 
um, just to kind of get a feel of like what their interests are um, and who they are as a person, because ultimately this is someone that I will be working with as well. Um, the next step, if this is to go well, the interview goes well, we do a working interview, uh, also known as a stage, it's French uh, for the word stage. Um, so essentially this gives the employee or prospective employee an opportunity to see how we do things in the kitchen and also gives us an opportunity to see how they work and carry themselves in the kitchen. Um, if generally, if somebody is getting a working interview, it does mean that I'm going to hire them. But in the case that it does not work out, um, we still pay them for that time through a, uh, W9. Um, so like a, like gig work, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, otherwise I hire them and we have them sign an employee handbook. Um, this handbook I typed up from a previous restaurant that I worked at. I basically typed it up verbatim and changed a few things. Um, I do think that you can find resources, uh, for handbooks through the, um, Thurston EDC and Washington Hospitality Association. You can find templates for those sorts of things, um, online and um, it's worth reaching out to other uh, resources like the Washington Hospitality Association to help with help you with those things as a small business. Um, something else I will want to work on in the future is kind of adding job descriptions to that, um, which is another uh, element of um, you know having the employees kind of sign off on what what responsibilities are expected of them. We don't really have a formal training program at the restaurant. It's very much, um, I put a lot of responsibility on the employees um, and we don't really have the time to work through each step of the menu or the dishes um, in a formal ma manner because we don't have the resources and the time to be able to do that. So a lot of the employees are expected to be training on the job um, in real time. Um, our menu changes regularly. And so it makes it difficult to have a typed up form of, you know, step by step of everything that needs to be done for each dish. Um, but I do think that this creates a sense of purpose and pride in the employees um, who thrive in that kind of environment where a lot of responsibility is put on them um, and pushes them to work really hard. Um, and do something that, again, that they're, they're proud to be contributing to. Um, the kind of qualities I look for in employees are ones that are self-starting. They, they think critically. Um, they're good at problem solving and working as a team. And, um, you know, the idea is that I want to train them in a way that they can think like I would think as the chef and be able to represent myself and my business in our uh, restaurant. Um, a really great example of this um, is I have an employee who has no prior kitchen experience. I hired her, um, let's see, in the fall of last year. Um, she had gone to school for like film and theater and had been doing that for a long time um, and then decided to get into culinary. And I feel like there are a lot of parallels between that industry and the culinary world um, because it's a lot of like, you, you know, you're getting ready for service. So in this case for her, it was like getting ready for a show, working with the team. You've got a new set of problems to solve every day. It's very dynamic. You're on your feet. Um, you know, you're having to think critically. And she, uh, you know, moved into that position in the kitchen very seamlessly. Um, and I think it's because of that dynamic work environment that's so similar to the film and theater industry. Um, and jumping into the culinary arts. So um, I hired her with no experience, but she naturally had that drive that I'm always looking for in employees. And that's another great example of, you know, an alternative lifestyle, like finding people who f find um, a job in the culinary world can really thrive in that versus someone who may be um, working a nine to five job at a desk is for some folks, but not for everyone. And so that is a benefit to working um, in restaurants. Um, all right, so I'm gonna kind of talk more about management um, from my perspective. Um, I'll be using the term dynamic work environment a lot throughout this uh, because it truly is, no day is the same. Um, you can, 
you can expect interruptions and distractions to happen, but you can't necessarily plan for them. And I think a key to being a good manager is being able to navigate that with grace. Um, I have myself have absolutely not mastered that, but it is something that I work on all the time. Um, and it's important that um, you are um, handling things gracefully and being realistic with the amount of time you have. So if I were to go into work and never get an interruption, I could get 12 things done in a day, but that's not realistic because I'm, I've got all these other people who are working under me who are going to have questions. I have people bringing in deliveries. I have guests coming in asking if they can make a reservation, even when we're closed, that happens all the time. Um, and so to be more realistic with what I'm actually able to accomplish and kind of cutting that list in half or in third or even in, into a quarter um, so that you're not disappointing yourself at the end of the day because you felt like you didn't get enough done. Um, there's not really an office for me to lock myself away into. And so the pressure, there's a lot of pressure in always being on and available for the employees. Um, it's also really important to know how to identify personality types. I mean, you're kind of having to be a amateur psychologist in a way because you can't treat everyone the same way across the board. Um, so it's really important when it comes to praising and criticizing and managing people that you are mindful of who you're talking to and um, doing it in a way that's gonna be the most receptive for them. Um, less fun parts of my job, employee write-ups. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a, something that Adam and I avoided doing for a few years because we felt that it was very impersonal and pretty corporate to have these write-ups and that just expecting people to do their job would be enough. Um, but you really need to keep receipts um, when you have issues with employees. And um, it is an uncomfortable conversation to have. We've since put in, uh, implemented like a standardized system that kind of holds all the employees accountable to the same expectations and helps eliminate these gray areas um, when employees are not doing the job that's expected of them. This is also a benefit to having job descriptions. Um, you can never be too thorough about it. Um, I've even seen some restaurants go as far as to have the employees initial every element of the description of their job when they get hired so that if things are falling short you've got that receipt that says you signed agreeing to doing this uh part of your job um the reason why we started implementing the employee write-ups is there's a example um it happened to us at the restaurant about a year ago. We had a server who was consistently late for her shifts, and there had been verbal conversations um, about her needing to show up on time, and then she would get better, and then it would kind of, she'd get out of habit again and continue to be late, and throughout that, we could have easily done write-ups every time that she was late, and then been like, three strikes, you're out, or something like that. Um, but instead there was one day that she showed up very late and Adam and I decided to let her go at the end of her shift. And, um, it wasn't really fair for her because she did not have, she didn't know that she had crossed this imaginary line that Adam and I had created. And, um, it's beneficial for the employees to know where they stand as far as, um, when they make those kinds of mistakes, um, or, you know, aren't holding up their end of the agreement as an employee. Um, and so it after that situation, we started doing employee write-ups and that has made things a lot more cut and dry and kind of taken the emotional aspect out of it, which makes things a little bit easier to manage um, from our standpoint. Um, keep receipts, okay. Employee reviews, I do these about once a year. Um, this is an opportunity for the employees to reflect on their performance to list areas of improvement and also talk about things that they're really proud of, that they feel like they've contributed to the restaurant. Um, and an opportunity for me to kind of see where they stand as far as you know, their future at Chicory, their, their future personally. Um, I'm gonna exit out of this briefly just to kind of show you guys. Um, this is our handbook, just to kind of scroll through this. So this is our uh, history of Chicory as a restaurant, of Chicory as a plant. Um, we kind of talk about policies, um, 
etc um and then at the end they sign the handbook um the employee review form this is how i've structured it so um we have many as you can see like a few um elements um of uh qualities of the employee um i have them fill this out for themselves and then i fill out my own copy and then we compare um and uh that kind of uh again kind of makes it this black and white thing it's very easy to like put it into new a numerical uh system and we can kind of compare the scores that we gave the employee um and then the second page the employees fill out by themselves we talk about proudest accomplishments and their strengths uh talk about things that they'd like to grow and improve on and then long and short-term goals um and then anything else that they would like to discuss with me um let me go back um, we do this once a year, um, earning respect as a manager is something that's really important. I think that, um, uh, the way that Adam and I have been able to achieve that is because we're present at the restaurant. I mean, 90% of the time, uh, when we work alongside our employees, they see us, we're in the trenches with them most days. Um, it is a very high stress work environment. So it's really important that our employees have the tools that they need to do the job well. So I, I really try to, you know, an open door policy, even though we don't have any doors in the restaurant anyway, but I want my employees to be able to feel like they can come to me. Um, and, and if they see inefficiencies in the way that we're plating a dish or the way that a recipe is written out, like I'm open to discuss that in a way that could make it easier for them and better for the restaurant. Um, a huge I guess philosophy that I stand by and will always stand by is I never ask anybody to do something I would not do myself. Um, and that includes, you know, cleaning out the drains in the corner of the, of the kitchen or anything like that. Like I've done it before. I'm going to ask an employee to do it, but I would never ask them to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do on my own. Um, and I do think that that creates uh, respect um, for me as a manager and as an, as an owner. Um, Adam and I are owner operators, which means we own the business and we also work in the business. Um, I do feel like it can be trickier to create that level of respect as just an owner. Um, not impossible, but from a small business standpoint, I do think it's really important that your employees see you, uh, care as much about the business as hopefully they do, um, or at least encourage that. Um, one uh, style of management that I've been told about in the past from previous uh, em employees or employers rather is pigeon management. And it's kind of this idea of, you know, generally you're an owner, but you're not in the restaurant that often. And then you come in the restaurant, you swoop in, shit on everything and leave in the sense that you're like this is you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong i don't like this i don't like that and then you just leave and you're not there on a regular basis to kind of implement those changes that you want to see um and so it's really important to have a presence in your business at least in the beginning um while you're working on making those systems and putting those systems into place um let's see Um, all right, so equity in the workplace. Um, we have a, I do want to say one more thing about the pigeon management and just management in general. It is really important that you aren't just criticizing all the time. Um, I really have to pick my battles at the restaurant. Um, I'm a bit of a control freak to begin with and perfectionist. Um, but if I'm constantly telling people that they're not doing stuff right, then nobody feels like they're getting better or understand or feeling like, why am I? why am I here if I can't do my job right? So it's really important that you pick your battles and you also, uh, for every criticism you give, you also give a compliment is a good, like, um, you know, guide to stand by so that people continue to feel encouraged and want to work hard for you. Um, equity in the workplace, uh, the way that we have, uh, the, the tip tipping structure, um, implemented at the restaurant is we have a 20% automatic gratuity that gets added to all of the checks. Um, 
this gets split, this 20% gets split equally between the front and back of house. Um, Adam and I are excluded from this as managers. Um, this means that when we're busier, everybody's making more money um, instead of just the servers making more in tips. Um, it increases the amount of camaraderie because everyone is making more when we're busier. Um, and there is more respect between the front and back of house. I feel like historically, at restaurants, there's usually like the front and back are butting heads because the kitchen feels like they're not getting paid enough and the servers are walking away with all of the money. And so that can, you know, cause some, some, a rift um, in between those two sides of the business. But having everybody make the same amount creates uh, a stronger sense of uh, camaraderie um, and in general has been beneficial for us. Um, it also means that the kitchen's making a lot more than they would be making anywhere else. And um, as far as, you know, what the average pay rate is for cooks in Olympia, um, the kitchen's making, you know, anywhere between 25 to $30 an hour. And so that means that there, we have uh, less staff turnover because people are staying longer. Um, and this helps with staff retention. Um, 20% service fee. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about working with local purveyors, both in a from a social perspective and an environmental perspective and an economic perspective, I suppose. So this is a huge part of my job um, and one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, working with building these relationships with farmers and producers is huge. Um, and a lot of times it can take um, several seasons to be able to establish, you know, an ingredient that I'm hoping to put on the menu. Um, with building these relationships, sometimes farmers have excess ingredients and they wanna move it, or sometimes um, they, I was planning on buying one thing from them because I got it from them the year before and they're not growing it anymore or the, the season's been um, not, not conducive for that uh, particular ingredient. Um, so that requires a lot of flexibility for me as a, as a chef, um, and, you know, having that communication between those farmers about like, Hey, how, how is this, um, how are the tomatoes looking this year? Are they going to be ready about this time? You know, so that I can also help plan the menu or if a farmer has like, they got a bumper crop of jalapenos one year and they're like, Hey, we'll give you a deal on this. If you buy, you know, 20 pounds or something like that. Um, but again, it does require a lot of flexibility. I have to be adaptable. It, you know, all of the skills that I've learned over the past 12 years, um, learning how to work with different ingredients and, and figuring out ways to put them on the menu. Um, and that is also a reason why we, um, have the staff that, they they're drawn to that because we're changing the menu regularly which means i get to learn new stuff um often um we do an annual farm tour every summer with our employees um and i'll usually do two farms sometimes uh in the past we've done um like livestock farms we've done vegetable farms um we've kind of been to like some homestead kind of places um this is um adds value to our our dining experience because the front of house is able to uh, tell our guests about the cabbage coming from this farm and they got to see it grow in the fields and got to meet the farmer. Um, from back of house perspective, the cooks see that cabbage, they treat it with more respect when they're preparing it and uh, put more love into it um, generally. And so it adds to the dining experience and it gives the employees a uh, perspective of like where the food is coming from, which is which is huge. Um, here's some cute photos of the staff at our tour last year. Um, the one on the left is at Ladyberry. Um, Evan is kind of walking towards the front and she was guiding us around her farm and showing us where she plants everything. The one to the right was um, at another farm. They had chickens and cows and um, bees and just kind of more of a homestead setup, but it was just really a really fun day for the staff to like get to meet all the critters. And that's a very cute staff portrait of us um, in the middle of the summer. Um, 
And let's see if there's anything else I wanted to add. Um, right, okay, so we're gonna start going uh, over economical sustainability. Um, working with other small businesses um, is beneficial to our community because we're keeping that money within the community. And I'm also making a conscious effort to work with businesses whose values align with ours. Um, uh, the challenges that come with that, and I kind of talked about this previously, but um, it does require us to be uh, flexible with the ever-changing availability of what farmers are able to sell. Um, it does sound quite romantic, um, but sometimes there's little to new, no warning about what we might, what the farms might run out of. Um, and so that really requires us to like think on our feet. Um, uh, recently, uh, we had been using this sheep's cheese feta from a farm in Chehalis called Black Sheep Creamery. And I reached out to order more feta like I always do and emailed Brad, who was the feta maker. I was like, hey, I'm ready to get more feta. And his response back was like, hello, I actually am retired now. So we're not doing this anymore. And it was like, no warning you know, no heads up. I had no idea what was going to happen. And then just having to like, you know, solve that problem in real time. And I'm still looking for a local feta maker if anybody knows anyone. Um, we are working with local ingredients that are um, generally going to be more expensive than something that might have been grown in California or Mexico. So that means that our higher price point uh, we have to reflect that in a higher price point is what I'm trying to say. Um, I spend a lot of my time sourcing ingredients with local purveyors, but having to get creative with kind of juggling all of the different purveyors and making sure I'm hitting all of the minimums. I'm ordering the stuff on, on the right time because everybody has different uh, delivery dates um and you know also comparing prices across the board so that does take a lot of time and would be much simpler if i just ordered everything from cisco or us foods or something and had one invoice and everything was coming from the same place um but that is not who chicory is that has been a huge part of our identity from the beginning um with getting excess of ingredients sometimes, or even ingredients that have a very short window of um, availability, um, we work on building a larder throughout the year. Um, a lot of stuff in the summer and fall, we preserve in different ways so that we can uh, have ingredients to use later in the year in the winter and uh, early spring. Um, this kind of requires uh, taking ingredients at the peak of their season, season, and again using them later in the year. Um, we some methods we use: uh, pickling, freezing, dehydrating, fermenting, and juicing. Um, <clears throat> we are we'll buy huge amounts of stuff and process them and put them away, uh, whether it's in a pickle brine in the refrigerator or frozen, um, and having a plan uh beforehand to kind of know what we need to do um for example um we have some like seasonal staples so things that come back every year so when i know that sunchoke season is going to roll around come october i've got a dish in mind or at least a template of a dish in mind and i'm ready to start buying that right away and start using it um and so we have some things that come back every year and we maybe change them a little bit here and there but um people come to expect those staples. Um, it also can reduce uh, prep on certain dishes. If I know that I've got a bunch of hot pepper jelly in the freezer um, and I wanna make a dish with that, that's one element that I'm not gonna have to worry about that's like already done. So it does um, kind of cut back on some of the prep. Um, value added products are a huge part of um, sustainability and um, we have been doing that. I Paige was kind of the first one to put those words together for me, but um, basically a great example of this is, um, for example, at Concord grapes, we get a huge, um, uh, like maybe the course, course of like three weeks, we'll be getting flats of Concord grapes from one of our farms. 
Um, and the season's quite short. And so what we ended up doing with them is we made sorbet with the juice. We cooked a bunch down and um, uh, turned it into Concord grape jelly and use that on a dessert that lasted us up until like last month, honestly. Um, and we also put some in a cocktail. So we took one ingredient and did three different things with them that ended up lasting us almost six months. Um, so yes, jam, sorbet, cocktails. Um, our carrot dish is another great example. So um, the carrots come from a local farm. I get them from various farms. Um, the feta was coming to me locally. Currently it is not, but hopefully we can change that in the future. Um, I was getting local microgreens from a farm um, to garnish the dish. There's salsa matcha and fermented chili flake in the dish that is coming from splat hot sauce. So I'm supporting like five different um, businesses in one dish. Um, and that is a great example of value added products and how we're supporting um, other businesses at Chicory. Um, okay, so we'll go into environmental sustainability. Um, sourcing ingredients from businesses who in, whose environmental philosophies align with ours. Um, as far as farms go, working with farms that uh, do no-till, regenerative farming, they rotate their crops, um, they're you know stewards of the land, if you will. Um, I prioritize organically grown versus organically certified because getting a USDA certification for uh, uh, a USDA organic certification, um, not everybody has the resources to be able to do that. It can be quite expensive, especially if you're a really small farm. So if I know that my farmers are working with the land in a way that is sustainable so that they can continue to um, harvest things from the land is really important to me. And that is also something we see firsthand when we go and do these farm tours. Um, some of the farms I work with, Wobbly Cart, Sundowner, Five Hearts, Lady Berry, New Wacom Valley, and Kingfisher. Um, with my meat producers, um, I we have a good handful of uh, small farms nearby that I'm able to get stuff direct from, like Kersop and Riverbird. Kersop is in Rochester, Riverbird is in Shelton, Washington, and I'm able to work directly with them. I have a direct relationship with Falcon Fishery. Um, they are in Westport and they do sablefish. Um, I work with a company called Preservation that is based out of Seattle and they source meat from uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and uh, bring in whole animals and butcher them and then sell them. So they're kind of a middleman, but they make it a lot easier for me to be able to get locally, uh, regionally sourced proteins. Um, Cuts Butchery is a butcher shop a couple blocks away from us. And while they are not getting proteins that are locally sourced, I am buying um, like chicken thighs from them from our, for our uh, hot chicken sandwich. In order to keep that price low, I have to, some things I have to get that are, uh, you know, a, a factory farmed. So, um, but I am supporting a local business down the street for me. Um, so that's kind of the, the compromise. Um, while I wish that everything that we got was locally sourced, I have to make some compromises in order for us to be profitable as business. Um, some specialty stuff. I work with Splat Hot Sauce based out of Olympia. I get We get our bread from the Bread Peddler only a couple blocks away from us. Um, Halyards uh, down the street also makes uh, their uh, smash burger spot. We buy burger buns from them for our uh, pulled pork sandwiches for brunch. Uh, Black Sheep Creamery is another uh, local creamery that we work with. Um, natural wine is what we pour exclusively on the menu. Um, really, natural wine needs its own whole other presentation. There's a lot to say about it, but essentially we're buying wine from winemakers who um, are uh, using low intervention native yeast and growing in uh, biodynamic uh, methods. So they are being mindful about their impact on the environment as winemakers. Um, we do have a smaller carbon footprint because we are getting ingredients locally versus getting them shipped from uh, elsewhere. Um, and this kind of, you know, leads to less 
gas emissions, uh, simple as that. Um, and most of the time our farmers are not driving huge box trucks, they're driving smaller vehicles. Um, and so that also makes an impact. Um, and so I conclude my presentation um, and hopefully that covers um, a lot of information for you all as uh, I think there are plenty of things within that that are not necessarily specific to restaurants. Um, so hopefully you find some of that information valuable. Um, and I guess now we can open it up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Elise. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay if I read you some questions that are in the chat? Yes, perfect. Okay, so the first one we have is how did you slash do you start a business relationship with local farms? Um, so this has kind of happened a couple different ways. Um, generally, farms come to me because we have a reputation now at Chicory of a restaurant that um, works with farms and uh, makes dishes with local ingredients. Um, generally, what will happen is somebody will come in maybe give me their business card or something like that. And then um, I start asking them like, hey, can you shoot me an email with your fresh sheet? And that's like a weekly email, sometimes bi-weekly, just depends on the farm um, of the things that they have available with prices. And that's how I determine you know, what I'm going to order. Sometimes farms will bring in samples. That's a really great way to get my attention um, because I'm such a tangible person to see these beautiful snap peas in front of me makes me want to work with you than just like seeing it typed up on a, on an email. Um, I also do some, uh, reaching out to farms as well. And that generally only happens when, uh, I hear about a farm growing something really special. So for example, there's a farm that just started growing saffron and this last fall was their first um, season, but we've kind of planted the seed, no pun intended, to work again in the future in the fall, um, this coming fall, uh, to get saffron from them. So sometimes those relationships take a few years to be able to get it established. But when I see that, uh, when I hear about farms that are growing something really special um, outside of the standard carrots and onions and potatoes, um, I'm more inclined to reach out and work with them. Um, so that's it's that's generally how it works is an exchange of contact information and then we kind of just go from there. I have a follow up question to that. I recently saw you post something about Washington grown oranges. Oh yeah. How's so, that? Um, one of the farms I work with, uh, New Wacom Valley, they're in Rochester. I'm not sure how long ago they bought their farmland, but they inherited some orange trees in one of the greenhouses and um, have kind of nursed them back to health because the oranges have been a little fussy to grow uh, naturally because they're not meant to be up this far north. Um, but in, in the winter around like January, February, um, they get a harvest of oranges and I always buy a case from them. And I will say the oranges are not the most delicious eating oranges. Like they're not super juicy and not very sweet, but we do use uh, them. Like we're making orange marmalade right now. Um, and we're also going to preserve some in salt and use that for like a future dish. Um, so it's just a really special product. Like no one else, no other farms that I'm working with are growing oranges. So um, I definitely make an effort to uh, reach out to them when it is that time of the year and make sure I get my hands on a case of oranges. And they're beautiful oranges. Um, they're huge. They're enormous and like so fragrant. Um, so that that's what we like to do with those. That's amazing. Okay, uh, next question. How do you handle the separation between your income and your employees? And then what parameters do you use so that it is clear and ethical? So one thing I I hope that we can get to eventually at Chicory is to have a better system of like um, open book management. Um, this is something that a lot of businesses um, have kind of adopted where you can sit down with your employees and show them a P&L and show them where the money is going. Um, as of right now, 
my employees make more money than I do if you base it off of the amount of hours worked um, by quite a lot. Um, I don't have resentment about that um, because obviously this was the path that we have chosen and hopefully we can get to a point where, um, you know, we're, we're making more than our employees are. Um, but I think something that's really important to remember is that all of the risk that you're taking as a business owner is that's on you. And in that regard, like you, sh you should be compensated for those risks that you're taking. The employees, while they are working really hard, are getting paid for every hour that they're there. They get to uh, go home and leave work at home. Um, and those are the conveniences of being an employee. Um, I think that I don't ever see it getting to a point at Chicory where Adam and I are making, you know, three or four times the amount that our employees are making just because of the nature of the restaurant industry, like the um, wage disparity, I don't think would ever be that huge um, because the profit margins are so small. But, um, you know, looking into open book management is um, is something to consider if that is something you want to be really uh, mindful about. And um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like vis visibility so people can kind of see the, the full thing. And that can also benefit you from a business standpoint. If you're showing your employees, um, I think one of the articles I shared with the prior reading um, on Eater, they kind of break down their P&L. Something that can be really beneficial is if you show your employees like, hey, this is how much money we're making and this is how much we're spending on everything else. Maybe your employees can see that in that article, for example, this business owner, one of her employees found a better deal for like a linen uh, service company and was able to save the business some money. And maybe that business owner didn't necessarily have the time to be able to dissect that and look at other options. So it can be beneficial to you from a business standpoint. If your employees know how much money is getting made, but how much is getting spent and having a better idea of that, um, that mindfulness can be really beneficial to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this next question, I had two questions that are really just the same question. Um, so I'll just combine them. Uh, what business or farm are you hoping to partner with next? Great. Um, while I'm really looking forward to this saffron farmer uh, working with them, I also just reached out to a company in Oregon who grows seaweed, who grows dulce seaweed, um, and kind of figuring out how we can get their seaweed on our menu as well. So again, those are like some really specialty things. Um, and one of the farms that I have worked with in the past is going to start growing Cornish game hens, which are basically tiny chickens. Um, and so I'm kind of talking to them about, you know, when that timeline is going to happen and when we can get our hands on some of that. Um, but for the most part, um, I'm very fortunate to say that I am flush with farmers to work with. And generally, unless someone is growing something really special, I don't need to work with any other farmers because Otherwise I'd be, I could, if I worked with all the farms that were in the area, I'd be able to get like five pounds of carrots from one, a couple heads of cabbage from another, you know? So it's like, I've kind of condensed it down to maybe four or five farms that I regularly work with. Um, and I'm really fortunate to say that it's not always the case um, everywhere. Um, but generally when people come to me wanting to work with me um, as a farmer, I start with like asking them to give me a fresh sheet and like, more than half the time, I never hear back from them again um, because they're just not ready to be able to do that consistently. They're used to having a farm stand or a CSA or something like that. Um, so there are not necessarily farms that I'm, more farms that I'm hoping to work with unless they have something really special for me to put on the menu. This is a great segue to this um, other question I'm seeing. Uh, what advice would you give to a restaurant that's located in a food desert that wants to source locally? Um, yeah, so that is a brave endeavor. Um, 
I think a great example of a solution to that is there are some restaurants um, that have a farm that is part of the restaurant and all of the ingredients from that farm are going to the restaurant. Um, uh, one spot in particular that um, I know of is called Okta. It's like O-K-T-A. It's in Oregon in Willamette Valley. They're a restaurant that has a farm and they're, they coexist and benefit each other. So all the things that are growing on the farm are going into the restaurant. Um, but it is tricky, even outside of that, you got to make sure that you've got a clientele who cares about that or be able to have the resources to educate those guests so that they understand, you know, what, what they're supporting and who they're supporting. Um, because if you don't have guests that care and they'd rather just get, you know, a burger and fish and chips down the street from, with ingredients from Cisco or something like that, um, then nobody's going to come into your restaurant and pay that premium for those locally sourced ingredients. Um, it obviously takes a lot of resources and money um, to be able to build a farm as well as a restaurant, but um, not impossible. And there are several restaurants in the country that have that kind of um, formula for uh, using local ingredients. Thank you. I'll also add just a little plug. If you're a restaurant that's located in a food desert and wants to source locally, check out the WSDA grant, Local Food System Infrastructure. That is the grant for you. Um, Great. Last question. Uh, you mentioned a membership with the Washington Hospitality Association. How has that been useful to you and would you recommend it? Um. So when we first opened the Washington Hospitality Association had reached out to us as well as like Thurston County Chamber of Commerce and like some other groups and all of them were asking us for money for membership. And at the time it felt overwhelming and we were like, we don't have extra money to give you guys. So it took us a couple of years to finally get a membership with the Washington Hospitality Association. I do feel like it's been very valuable. They do a really good job of giving us uh updates on like right now legislation is in session things bills that are trying to get passed that pertain to us as restaurant owners and as small business owners um they do a really good job of updating us on the status of some of those bills and if there are ways that we can you know petitions that we can sign ways that we can show our support um because otherwise i don't think that i would be following those things as closely um they have lots of resources as far as um you know, employee handbook stuff, job descriptions, um, even like stuff as simple as um, costing sheets. Um, they can help you find better deals with credit card processing, which is like a huge expense from a business, small business standpoint. Um, and yeah, ultimately like have tons of resources. They have like a help hotline or whatever, if there are issues on how to navigate staffing or anything like that. So for me, I do feel like it's been very beneficial um, the membership is $500 a year, which is hefty, but, um, I do think that we've gotten our money's worth out of it and has been, um, makes things a little bit more accessible for us as, uh, as small business owners. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to say, uh, thank you to Elise Landry for this wonderful lecture. And also thank you to everyone that is watching it. Um, this was week four of the Sustainability Business and Entrepreneurship Lecture Series.